Okay, well, good morning. What I'd like to talk about during my presentation is uh, label updates with respect to the herbicides dicamba and paraquat for the upcoming growing season. As most of you know, uh, dicamba formulations available in DT crops went through a recent re-registration, and as a result, the EPA stipulated additional uh, precautions and requirements for their use on the label that are going to uh, impact a number of us this growing season. So we're going to kind of quickly go through those. Uh, Paraquat is also undergoing a complete re-registration, a, a review at this particular time. Uh, and as a result, the EPA has proposed several label changes. They're not in effect right now, but they've proposed those. Luckily, only a couple will uh, impact us. So that's what I like to do today is just kind of quickly go over those. If you want to point to a culprit or a flashpoint for the issues we've had with dicamba the past couple of years, you have to look no further than this slide to the left and the weeds that are that are uh, populating the middle of the soybean rows, and that's Palmer amaranth. I don't think in my 30 something years through grad school in weed science that there's been a weed that has been talked about prayed about, cussed about, written about, researched about more than Palmer amaranth, and for good reason. Uh, single Palmer amaranth plant is able to produce 800,000 viable seeds. So it's a uh, mother nature has put resistance in a very, very potent weapon. So we've had to deal with that. And as a result, companies have, have tried to develop traits, in this case, using older materials such as dicamba and 2,4-D to apply over the top because in, in historically they've been very effective on this particular weed and pigweed in general. Uh, in the early research, looking at it, as you can see in the slide to the right, tabletop clean, no weeds present, good tolerance. So everybody was excited to have this uh, technology come on board. And if you recall, in 2016, actually, the varieties that uh, contain the dicamba tolerance trait were released prior to the dicambas being registered for use in these crops. And at that time, a couple of us scratched our, our heads on that because obviously there were dicamba formulations already available for use, not on DT crops, but in non-crop land situations and other crops such as corn. So that kind of maybe opened the window to have some applications go out that shouldn't go out, especially where people were dealing with these Palmer amaranth issues and really had nowhere else to turn. And it came, you know, using these dicambas that they shouldn't use or, or losing a crop. So here in 2017, we were able to use the, the dicamba over the top of DT crops. And like we thought in the research, we saw pretty good weed control, clean rows like you see here. What we also started seeing is a lot of reports of fields that look like this, a lot of upward cup leaves, that lighter white look along the margin, very, very uh, typical of what you see with dicamba on soybeans. Soybeans are extremely sensitive to dicamba research conducted at LSU has shown that as much as little as one 1,250th of an X rate applied during reproductive growth stage can lead to about a 15% yield reduction. So very, very, very sensitive. And we were seeing this injury, not just what you'd normally see in a drift situation where it drifts, you know, 30 rows or, or so into a field, kind of a moon shape, kind of tapers off from an adjacent crop. But we were seeing equal injury, as you're seeing in this slide here, over thousands of acres, over multiple fields, over several miles. So it's definitely an issue that started raising a red flag pretty quick. And this slide here is a slide from October of uh, 2017, mid-October, just to showing the uh, number of official uh, investigations that were being reported to the State Departments of Agriculture. You see there were almost 3,000 cases in that first year alone. About a third of those cases were in the state of Arkansas, where they've had, you know, drift issues with other herbicides through the years. But the majority of the rest were concentrated in the, the heavy soybean growing areas of the Midwest. So obviously everyone's experiencing that. You see in Louisiana, we only had two cases and we've been fortunate enough for these past several years that uh, the number of cases we've had have been relatively low as far as negative impacts with dicamba. Sort of looking at what the, the led to these issues the first year, obviously we were concerned about the, the uh, formulations that were available not to use on DT crops and, you know, checking through the various cases. Obviously that was, you know, some of the issues and people were, were using uh, non-labeled dicambas in these uh, generics in these crops. And 
Obviously, they didn't have the right technology to prevent drift volatility, so we saw a lot of that happen. Uh, in addition, subsequently, this the past couple of years, uh, research has shown that the addition of Roundup in with the dicamba tends to lower the spray solution pH as much as two units. And when you do that, you have more of the dicamba molecule being associated to its acid form, which is much more volatile. In that form, it can essentially get up and walk out of that field and you have vapor drift which can move hundred which can move over thousands of acres several miles being dispersed out evenly and that's a lot what you're seeing with these thousands of acres showing the same amount of, of symptoms so that was an issue obviously if you see this picture in the upper right of the slide uh we had issues of just regular normal you know physical drift uh, under you know uh, windy conditions and obviously some spray tank contamination issues. It's very water soluble and easy to get out of the spray tank, but you need to clean the entire sprayer to get make sure it gets out, especially when you're spraying on the top of, of non-DT soybeans as sensitive they, as they are. In the bottom left of the slide, you see a situation where we have a, a temperature inversion that's been set up and a lot, some applications were made during these temperature inversions and the spray drift was sort of trapped between that layer of cold and hot air. And when it gets trapped, these, uh, the spray uh, particles are suspended. And once the wind picks up, carries this entire cloud, if you will, of spray drift over thousands of acres before it settles out. So that's why we're seeing some of these, these bigger issues over thousands of acres. So those are some of the culprits that were identified from injury in these, these early years. So how did we get where we are today? Just wanted to present a quick timeline to take us to today. Uh, in 2018, the EPA extended the direct camber registration and DT crops an additional two years to where they would expire this year, this December. Uh, that same year, a suit was filed by an NGO claiming uh, the decision violates the FIFRA and the Endangered Species Act. And before going any, any further, I want to kind of focus on the Endangered Species Act and, and kind of recant a story that I had or a conversation I had last year with a colleague, one of the chemical companies, about the Endangered Species Act. This seems to be the mechanism that a lot of these NGOs or uh, non-governmental organizations are using. They would like to eliminate pesticide use or severely reduce it. So they're going around with the, these Endangered Species Act. They found a, a good mechanism to try to, to get this. Uh, the Endangered Species Act was enacted in the mid-60s, 1966, I think. Around 1970 and the early 70s, the uh, National uh, Wildlife uh, and Fisheries Organization, not sure if that was the, the official name of it back then, but they put an amendment in the Endangered Species Act, which is called a minimum zero effect or zero minimum effect. And essentially what that said is that for any pesticide that's registered, the drift rate of that pesticide had to have zero effect on the most sensitive species that it encountered. Well, for something like cotton, you would, uh, for 2,4-D, you think it would be cotton or grapes, but the EPA was allowed to uh, decide which species was used, and for 2,4-D it was actually onion. So all the restrictions and precautions on the current enlist uh, uh, 2,4-D, 2,4-D choline labels are based on onion. And what these NGOs are saying is that that's not the most uh, sensitive species. So they're trying to get all the registrations canceled for this particular fact. And I think there's currently a, a suit that it, that's in, my, in the uh, uh, Ninth Circuit trying to look at that. So kind of like this past year when the dicamba suit that was filed in 2018 kind of snuck up on, on a lot of producers. I'm sure the companies had it in the back burner, but this is something that's kind of simmering in the back burner as well. So uh, 2019, the EPA registered tavium herbicide, which is a combination of dicamba and s metolachlor and it registered it to for one year to match the expiration date. It's this past December with the other two uh, three formulations that were that were current that were available, and all of a sudden, lo and behold, on June third, this past growing season, 2020, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals vacated the registration of the Ingenia, Extendamax, and Fexpam in use in dicamba tolerant or DT crops. There was no mention of Tavium. Now, simply because of the timeline, the suit was filed in 2018. Tavium was registered in 2019, and I don't know why some injunction or amendment, whatever the legal term is, was filed to include Tavium, but it was not included in the language. 
uh, for, a, for about a five day period there, there was a lot of confusion on, on what producers needed to do. They had obviously some of this dye camera in stock. Could they apply it? What, what needed to happen? So on the 8th of June, the EPA issued a full cancellation and clarified the ruling on producers, which answered a lot of those questions which existed. Uh, about a month later in early uh, July, Bayer and BASF resubmitted the registration applications to the EPA for their particular Extendamax and the Ingenia uh, dicamba herbicides. Uh, about a month later in, in mid-August, Syngenta submitted an application to EPA to extend the Tavium registration beyond the December 20th, 2020 uh, expiration date. And everybody, you know, sort of just waited it out and, and didn't know exactly what was going to happen with the EPA. But on uh, the end of October, on the 27th, the EPA approved the re-registration of Ingenia and Extendamax and extended the registration of Tavium uh, with the federal you know, labor requirements, which were additions that they added on and kind of beef things up. And I'll go through those quickly here in a second. And all those are set to expire on uh, December, right before Christmas in 2025. So a five year registration. As I mentioned, there's some updates to the current label, which are required by EPA. And just quickly going through those, those a downwind buffer area. Labels will require a 240 foot downwind buffer area from sensitive areas. These include water bodies, non-residential areas that harbor sensitive plant species, such as tree lines and things like that, and the crops. Now these are in this 240 foot buffer is for non-endangered species area. The buffer goes to 310 foot from sensitive crops plus an additional 57 foot buffer on the remaining sides not adjacent to the sensitive areas. These are in endangered species areas. Uh, obviously, you need to consult the EPA website to know if you're in an endangered species area, and you can do that up to six months in advance, and the website provides you with active bulletins on where an endangered species is, what counties, what parishes, so forth, endangered species are, and the bulletin that you have must be valid when you're making these applications a, a month in the month in which you're making the application. So make sure you, you do that and check that out before, uh, before making any application. Uh, the use of approved hooded uh, sprayers can reduce these buffer areas from one ten, uh, 240 down to 110 in the non-endangered species areas and from 310, 310 down to 240 where you have endangered species present. Now, currently there's only one approved uh, hooded sprayer for DT soybeans used to date and routinely check the, the uh, chemical company uh, websites every every week to make sure they're that things haven't changed. They're adding, you know, approved buffers and things like that all the time and make sure anything for the hooded sprayers hasn't changed as well. Uh, when we're talking about the, the buffer uh, area, this can include roads, mowed grass areas, prepared fields, bare grounds, planted areas to non-sensitive crops that are approved for dicamba use, and the footprints of, of buildings, you know, grass areas around your sheds, your grain bins, and so forth. All those areas can go into and be included in that buffer area. Uh, dicamba should not be applied when the wind is blowing toward a sensitive crop, even if you make it with a hooded sprayer application. Applications obviously can only be ground only. There's no aerial applications. Uh, for soybean, uh, Ingenia, cutoff date is June 30th. For Extendamax, it's June 30th, or if soybeans have reached R1, whichever comes first. And Tavium is again that June 30th date, or when the soybeans reach V4, whichever occurs first. Uh, for cotton, Ingenia, and Extendamax, it's the July 30th cutoff date. For Tavium, it's July 30th, or the six leaf stage, whichever occurs first. You're not allowed to make more than two post applications to uh, cotton over the top post applications to cotton or soybean for the Ingenia and Extendamax and Protavium, that's one allowable over the top application maximum. The application needs to be made starting one hour after sunrise and completed two hours prior to sunset. And the reason for that is try to get away from some of the temperature inversion issues. Temperature inversions don't just start right away when you're getting ready to spray right before sunrise. They kind of set in as the sun is setting. The conditions kind of come together like uh, ingredients in a gumbo. And, you know, the result the next morning is, you know, temperature inversion and you see the, the fog kind of settling low or dust being trapped in. You can kind of see it 
as you go down a, a gravel road as well. So this is kind of getting around some of that by giving you a, a, a window to make these applications. Only approved tank mixes can be applied and each, each label is going to have, each website is going to have the approved tank mixes. Currently there is no approval for Liberty herbicide being mixed with these tight canvas and there are only certain glyphosates which can be applied. So again, check the labels as these change frequently. Uh, no ammonium salts can be added such as AMS or UAN or acidifying water conditioners. Again, when you get that pH of the spray solution dropping low below five, you can get more volatility, more uh, 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 acid form of the dicamba, which is more volatile. So that's trying to get away from that. Uh, new this year, you're going to be required to add an approved pH buffer, a VRA or a volatility reduction agent. Uh, BSF is going to be promoting theirs uh, called Centris. Uh, there'll be multiple available for uh, from Bayer and Syngenta through some of the dealerships. So again, check their labels and their websites to make sure which one and a drift reduction agent, a DRA may be required on certain uh, labels. So make sure that you, uh, you, you follow those as well. Uh, look at some of the, the requirements for application. It's going to be a 15 gallon per acre minimum when you apply these herbicides. And a lot of people don't like to transport that much water to the field, but there's going to be a, a GPA minimum on these of 15. The wind, wind speed is going to be, need to be between 3 and 10 miles per hour when you make these applications. You know, everybody might wonder why not zero so that you don't get drift. Well, it's to get around those temperature inversions. You know, the three to 10 mile an hour tends to not let those, those set in and have those issues. Your ground speed is going to be need to be less than 15 miles per hour when making these applications. Five miles an hour is going to be recommended when making applications on these field borders or field edges. Uh, only approved nozzles can be used in your boom and your hooded sprayers. Just because you're using a hood sprayer doesn't mean you can go in with an all regular flat fan or, or anything like that. You're still going to only have to use the uh, nozzles that are approved on the individual labels. Your boom height is going to be at or below 24 inches above the spray target. And again, only approved hooded sprayers can be used. And I mentioned the one for DT soybean as I'm making this presentation. Uh, annual uh, training is going to be required like it has the last couple of years and the applicator, the one who is actually making the application, must have proper uh, certification from the states. You can't apply under a supervisor certification, so your pesticide certified application has to be for the person actually making the application. It can, they cannot work under there or make that application under the supervisor's uh, uh, certification. Uh, you need to triple rinse of your spray equipment. The second rinse is going to need to be a detergent tank cleaner. You're gonna, again, uh, it's very sensitive when applied to non-DT uh, soybeans, so remove all caps, screens, and nozzles. Do a thorough, thorough cleaning. As I mentioned, that camera, very water soluble, but you, but you need to make sure you clean everything that it touches. Uh, clean anything it comes in contact with. Your mixing equipment, your nurse tank, your hoses, and your pumps. You want to make sure it gets completely out of the system so there's nothing that can cause any contamination. Uh, going to be a lot of record keeping this year. I think there's around 22 field specific details and that's specific for each field you make an application. Record keeping within 74 hours after that task is completed. So it needs to be recorded for each field 72 hours after you make a, that specific task. And again, there are 22 tasks that need to have record keeping why you did this. You need to justify why you did this, why you didn't do this. Uh, you need to keep these available for inspection for two years as well. Uh, the kept mentioning the, the websites throughout my presentation. The EPA website is listed here. That's where you can go in and look at the endangered species bulletins and get an idea if you're in an endangered species area. Again, you need to have the bulletin that's active for the month in which you make the, the application in your possession. Uh, you see the three websites uh, for obviously Ingenia, Extendamax, Taven for the three products. And again, which whichever one you're, you're planning on using, uh, frequently, you know, go back and visit these websites as things change, more nozzles are added as approval. Again, the hooded sprayer, you know, on soybean, that may, that may change. Uh, 
the uh, volatility agents that are available for use on it and things like that. So they're they're kind of fluid. So consult those on a regular basis. Again, if you have any questions, you know, uh, consult the industry reps for these products, Ag Center personnel. I'm here to help Dr. Daniel Stevenson, uh, a middle uh, center part, central part of the states there to help us call us anytime. Uh, if we don't have an answer, we can sure get it for you or guide you to the right place to get the answer. And LDF personnel as well. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, Paraquat is currently undergoing a, a complete review. It's not a new product. Obviously, we've been able to use it in production agriculture for over 50 years. Uh, the EPA reviews uh, products every 15 years to make sure that they continue to meet their uh, FIFRA standards. And it just so happened that, that Paraquat uh, time came up. Uh, currently, they're producing a PID, a proposed interim registration review decision. That's what's going on right now. It actually started in 2011, so it's been going on with Paraquad. And this PID was published in 2020. They opened it up for public comment, and that ended right before Christmas this past year. And as a result, the EPA has proposed, they're not in effect yet, but they've proposed new safety measures. And these measures are, are primarily aimed at, at safety. Uh, of the product, safety uh, from use of the product uh, resulting from this PID. Uh, as I said, there's only a couple that may directly impact us. Mostly, uh, most of them won't. Uh, the first one is we can prohibit any aerial applications except for cotton desiccation, and that will impact us with our, our burn down applications. You're not going to be able to apply any paraquat formulations uh, uh, through aerial applications. Uh, it's going to prohibit the pressurized handgun and backpack sprayer applications. That may impact us on a little while on the things like fence rows or, or anywhere around your place that you're trying to, you know, clean things up. Uh, that may be an impact there. Uh, for alfalfa, it's going to limit the application rate to a pound active. Uh, it's going to require an enclosed cab if treated area in a 24-hour period is greater than 80 acres. Uh, it's going to require an enclosed cab or a PF10 respirator if the treated area in a 24 hour period is less than 80 acres. Uh, for cotton uh, desiccation application, it's gonna require a residential area drift buffer. Uh, not exactly sure what they're gonna settle on. I've heard anywhere 50, 75 foot, but it's gonna be on the, the particular labels and a seven day REI reentry interval, again, for those cotton desiccation applications. Uh, it's going to require a 48 hour REI reentry interval on all crops and uses except cotton desiccation. So you're going to have a 48 hour reentry period. It's going to add mandatory spray drift ma uh, management la language on the label. Not sure exactly how it's going to read, but it's going to change on the label. Again, it's going to allow truck drivers who are not certified applicators to transport open containers of Paraquat when certain conditions are met. Not exactly sure what those conditions are. Those will be spelled out, you know, on the label and in the, the PID if anybody wants to go in and read it. Uh, you're going to continue to have the mandatory training on the use, handling, and application of Paraquat as we have for the last couple of years. Again, that's a uh, uh, valid for every three years, you'll have to go through that particular training. So that, that hadn't changed. So only a couple of those are going to impact us. Again, a lot of changes with respect to the dicamba. Some of it continuing from last year. Some of it is new and, and, and some of it that was last year is going to be more stringent and kind of beefed up for this year. So uh, but make sure you consult those, those product uh, websites. And again, the EPA website has all those play an impact and, and are very fluid and can change on a weekly basis. So that's all uh, I have for you. And uh, again, there's my contact information. If you have any questions on anything I presented or any of these uh, new label changes, do not hesitate to give me a call. That's what we're here for. So thank you for your time today.